So when it when it comes to building an app, it's it's super easy to get caught up in the code side of things. So something I see a lot when I'm mentoring folks at Clever Beagle is I I get into conversations that are wholly focused on the code and how the code should be written and why is the code like this and what tools are we using to write the code. And those things are fine and they're important in their own kind of sense. They're they're not unimportant, but one of the things that I see a lot of people ignore in favor of that is the user interface. So the user interface is quite literally what people are using in your product. That is, for all intents and purposes, as far as they're concerned, your product. And so when you're you're thinking about what to focus your attention on, and especially when you're kind of following falling into that indie product maker kind of set, where you're like, oh, well, I, I'm responsible for everything. I have to do everything. If you're going to put a lot of energy into something, it's best to tilt your focus toward the user interface. So don't get too caught up in the code and, and the technology that you're using necessarily. And obviously there's, there's tons of caveats for that. But generally speaking, tilt your focus toward investing in uh, the, the user interface over the code. And the reason why, and there's, there's a quote that I really like that explains this, which is, uh, the details are not the details, they make the design. And that was by Charles Eames. So Charles uh, and his wife, Ray, they were uh, industrial designers that were wildly popular, still wildly popular uh, back in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and they've designed some of the most iconic furniture in the world. And if you're going to listen to anybody, that's the person to to kind of listen to. And so what I want to talk about today is one of the techniques that I like to use for adding detail or improving the quality of a user interface without the need for having a really sharp eye for aesthetic or visual design. So I know that a lot of developers get kind of fussy. They're like, oh, well, I, I don't know how to design or I'm not a good designer or something like that. And ultimately, and, and this is actually another quote kind of comes to mind, is uh, from you know, the granddaddy of them all, Steve Jobs, talking about uh, design is how it works. So it's not just how it looks, but literally the way that it functions and the way that users experience that functionality is the design. And so one of the details that I love to focus on, and I, I don't see it a lot, there's, it's definitely gotten more popular over the last few years, but it still gets ignored um, quite a bit, which is microcopy. And if you've never heard that term before, microcopy refers to the little bits of text in your user interface that help people kind of find their way or understand what they need to do or kind of explain like what's going on here. Why, why is this necessary? And so, uh, a good real world example of this is something like when you're, you're in an airport and you're kind of walking around and there's really clear signage everywhere. It's kind of like, here's where the baggage claim is. Here's where the restrooms are and all of that sort of information. That's a form of microcopy. So it's little bits of text that are guiding you on how to experience something. So in that case, how to experience an airport in the case of a user interface, how to experience an app or how to find your way around an app. And so when it comes to figuring out how to think about microcopy or like where do you even start that idea like how do you how do you do that uh the way that i like to do it is to think about your user interface as a conversation so quite literally if you think about uh, uh going to the grocery store so you go to the grocery store and maybe you're looking for some really obscure seasoning that you got in a recipe online and you can't find it and you're wandering around the store it's always going to be a much better experience if you bump into someone who works at the store and you can ask them one-on-one -on -one, like hey do you know where this thing is and they can respond back to you it's uh uh yeah that's aisle 10 it's it's a much better experience for you as a customer and it it, it ends up doing a lot of different things 
uh, kind of beneath the surface subconsciously. So first and foremost, it gives you a feeling that somebody has acknowledged your presence. You know, this is something where I see you as a human and you see me seeing you. It, it feels good. It's a natural feeling. Like you, you know that someone has acknowledged you and that you're, you're here and you're looking at this thing. Uh, another part of it is it helps you to find what you're looking for quickly or get at least get an answer quickly, uh, which especially when it comes to user interfaces and, and uh, ones that are a little more complicated or ones that uh, require a bunch of like little steps involved, it really helps if there's something that it's just telling me like, here's how to get what you want. And this one is the, the third thing I have in mind is something that's, um, I, I would say it's a 50, 50, sometimes it's going to happen. Sometimes it's going to not, but just like when you bump into that person in the store and they're very helpful and they can kind of point you right to what you want. If they're right, you know, they say like, oh yeah, you're the seasoning you want is on aisle 10 and it's there. Deep down, that's giving you kind of a, a warm feeling or a good feeling about that place. Um, not just because that one person was helpful, but that store kind of collectively set their employees up to make sure that all of their customers have a good experience. And so it kind of subconsciously tells you to go back later. You're kind of like, oh, yeah, I remember they were really helpful the last time I went in there. And so when it comes to microcopy, you want to think about it in this context. You want to think about it like it's a conversation. You want to say, okay, um, how would my user interface exist in physical reality? Meaning, um, if I'm building an application for something like a, uh, maybe it's an app for booking uh, therapy appointments, and I need to collect information about the user. So if we think about that in a real world context, okay, um, if I go to a doctor's office or a physician's office, I'm going to meet with a receptionist and they're going to need to take down my information, check me in, uh, maybe get some insurance information, like all of these details. An application that kind of replaces or aids in the process of that receptionist job is no different. So there's going to be a conversation of sorts that's going to take place when the user is completing a form, we'll say. So maybe they have an intake form in the app and it says, what's your first name? What's your last name? What's your social security number? What's your medical history? All these things. And so where microcopy comes in and the way to think about this stuff is, well, that form is technically a conversation with the person that's filling it out. And so what you can do is design the microcopy so that it's it feels like they're speaking to a human. Now, obviously, there's limitations to this, and <laughs> if you're not careful, it can get a little weird. And, and we'll we'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes here. But uh, what you can do is kind of tailor it as though they were talking to a human. So uh, a way that I like to do this, if you think about form inputs, so like uh, type your first name here, last name here, email address here. I'll kind of liven it up like I would if I was a human. Like, I'm not just going to talk to somebody like first name, last name. I'm not going to say those things. I'm going to say, hey, what's your first name? What's your last name? And putting like little bits and bobs of text or microcopy before field names really livens up the interface. It makes it feel like a conversation. So if you say, what's your first name? It feels kind of like I'm in a conversation or I'm talking to a human. And so it makes interfaces a hell of a lot more approachable um, and it makes it a, a much better experience for uh, your users as they're kind of going through your application. And so that's the, the core idea. You're trying to make your interface feel less robotic or less like they're using a computer. And the reason why, it, again, it plays back into that emotional sense and that subconscious feeling of like, I, I, I think I'm in the right place. And it's because you're taking the time to really S out those details around how you're speaking, even though you're not technically speaking to a user, you're speaking to them indirectly through your user interface. And even if it may not seem like it, users are incredibly discerning. Like they'll pick up on details like that. Even if they don't know why they like it, they can't articulate it. They're going to know that like, oh yeah, that was, that was really easy to get through. And microcopy is one of the ways that you, you can, you can really improve stuff and it's cheap. It's not something that, uh, 
requires too much thought or too much thinking. It's just thinking like, well, what is the user going to need here? Like, what do they need to know or that isn't immediately obvious? Like, what's something that we're doing in this interface that isn't standing out? And how can I clarify that by improving the way that I write the copy or the micro copy around the interface? So that's, that's kind of like part of the equation. The other part of it is how you actually write your micro copy. And more specifically, what I'm getting at here is the tone. So when you're writing micro copy, it's important to always keep in mind what context is that copy being read in. Because it's very, very easy to kind of teeter the line of writing micro copy that's technically good, but contextually bad. And so what I mean by that is consider uh, what we were talking about before with the, the whole f what's your first name or first name here. So inevitably, there's going to be a time when a user kind of speeds through a form and fills it out real quickly, and they're going to miss inputs. And so one of the best places to start, honestly, with microcopy is in your error messages. So they hit submit, and then it shows some red text like, hey, you got this wrong, or this isn't right. Um, and when it comes to things like tone, you got to be careful in these situations. Again, context is super important. So a good example would be, uh, say we have a first name input on our form and our user skips over it by accident. They fill out the rest of the form, hit submit. We're going to show them some, some error messages. We're going to show them some text. And so we want that text to contextually feel right. The tone should match the situation. And so a few examples of error messages, if they, if they forgot to fill in their first name, might be um, first name is required or needs a first name here or what's your name, friend? And so all three of those are essentially doing the same thing or saying the same thing, communicating the same thing, but they each have a different tone and they each fit a different context. So if we kind of go back to the, the example from earlier about uh, an app for, for therapy patients, right? Um, something like uh, first name is required. It's pretty bland, but it's, it shouldn't really feel out of context. It doesn't feel inappropriate, we'll say. Uh, need a first name here. Again, it's, it's a little friendlier. It's definitely more friendly than first name is required. That's, <laughs> that's a little serious, but need a first name here is pretty friendly. It's, it's, it's open-ended. But then that third example I gave you, what's your name friend? That feels noticeably upbeat and peppy and all this stuff. And in the context of something like a therapy app, you got to kind of consider like, well, maybe the people that are going to be interacting with this aren't peppy, aren't upbeat. Maybe they're not, you know, mentally in the best place. Um, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with those folks, but it means that their experience of the application is going to be happening through a slightly different lens. And so the microcopy that you use in those situations, or rather the tone of the microcopy that you use in those situations is super important. Because if I say, uh, you know, somebody, somebody's kind of bummed out and they come to, to see a therapist and the receptionist says, what's your name, friend? Uh, <laughs> that could be misconstrued as condescending or uh, kind of undermining that person. And that's not good. And so when you're thinking about microcopy, you really want to keep in mind, like, well, what is the tone here? What is the context that I'm, I'm writing this microcopy in? Because that same phrase of like, what's your name, friend? That would be great for an application for kids. You know, it's like, what's your name, friend? The kid's like, yeah, okay, this is fun. But if you do that to... Uh, an adult who's, you know, kind of suffering from depression or something like that, it's kind of a slap in the face. And so you got to be very, very careful. You know, don't be overly cutesy in a situation that doesn't call for it. But conversely, in a situation that, that may call for it or it could benefit from it, definitely do it. So you always want to keep in mind, like, okay, how is my interface talking to people? Is it is it being straightforward and is it considerate of that person in the context they're using the product in? Um, or is it the kind of the exact opposite? Like it's, it's technically filling in there, checking the box of having good microcopy, but the microcopy doesn't actually match, you know, the, the feeling or the vibe that that person's going to be experiencing the product in. So what I want to do to kind of, to kind of round this conversation out is give you some examples. And I, there's there's endless examples here. So I'm going to give you a handful that I think are really good places to start in your product. But um, 
don't let this limit your imagination. There's tons of stuff that you can do, and I highly encourage you to get creative with this stuff because it's it's one of those details that, again, it's easy. All you're doing is really just adding text, but the way that that improves the experience for the user is crazy. And and I, I would encourage you uh, to, when you're, when you're kind of out and about and you're interacting with other people's software, other people's applications, pay attention to this. So look for uh, when the appropriate tone and the appropriate micro, micro copy is put in the right place and really helps to improve your experience of using that application or that product because you're going to notice, oh, wow, this, this is the product that I keep going back to or this is the product that I keep recommending. And it's little details like that that are the reason why. So let's, let's jump into some examples of how uh, you can level up your own microcopy because uh, it may not be immediately obvious. Like we, we've talked about microcopy and tone and things like that, but it may not be immediately clear. Like, okay, how do I actually put this to use? How do I how do I do this? So uh, again, and I'm I'm kind of reiterating a point from a few minutes ago, but error messages are super easy for this. So um, if that's not clear, what I'm talking about is when somebody fills out a form and they hit submit. Uh, typically it's, it's good practice to have client side validation or form validation. So this is validation that appears visually in the browser for the user, or if you're doing a mobile app on the, on the screen, but this is, this is text that shows beneath an input. And usually it's, it's red or like a kind of a, a warning color, like, Hey, heads up. Um, and these are error messages that are helping the user to correct whatever mistake was made. And this is, again, this is a great place to start because it's, it's something that it, it's pretty much required because if you're building forms without uh, client-side validation, probably means that you're having some real headaches on the server side when you're trying to put data into your database. Um, and it also means that your users are going to be getting frustrated because there's, there's no feedback or communication. So if they do make a mistake and you don't have error messages, it's kind of like, uh okay, what do, what's wrong? What do I do? It's like if I click the button and just nothing happens, that's, that's a pretty bad experience. So generally speaking, you're going to have client-side validation, and this is a great place to start with uh, thinking about microcopy. Now, there's one caveat to this, uh, which is making sure that when you write this microcopy, and it kind of plays into the tone thing too, which is don't make your users feel stupid because it's very easy to be like, hey, you forgot this. And it's kind of like there, there's a number of different reasons why somebody would have forgotten something. Uh, maybe they were going too fast. Maybe it was actually their fault. They, they missed something. But you don't want to assume that. And you don't want to be like, hey, you got this wrong. Look what you did. Hey, hey, hey. Because it's going to give them a crappy feeling. They're like, oh, man, this form just bummed me out. You know, I'm like I filled this thing out and I didn't get it quite right. And now it's, you know, like making fun of me now. That's extreme. I'm, I'm hoping that most people aren't doing that, but uh, I have seen examples of it where it's it's kind of tactless error messages where it's just like, uh, you need to fix this or something like that. Again, it's it's something that's pointing a finger. So definitely think about your error messages first, but but consider that, okay, maybe I need to be a little lighter on folks and not not just make it sound like they made some massive mistakes. So that that's number one. Number two is a detail that I personally love to add to things, which is clarification on forms. So this isn't talking about the the labels or the, the error messages or anything like that. This is stuff that's kind of saying, here's what to expect. So it's trying to demystify, because if you think about, especially with forms, they're kind of like the door that people are going to stand at or go through into whatever the next part of your application is. And so when you're filling out a form, well, you have to consider that well, we're collecting all this information for a reason. This isn't accidental. This has a purpose. And so what you want to do is think about like, well, what is the purpose? So what is the end goal or what's going to happen in response to you collecting this information? And then once you understand what that is, go back and communicate that to the user. So clue them in on what's going to happen. And the reason for this, again, is it's making the user feel comfortable and things like that, but it's also making them trust you. Uh, because with all of this online stuff, especially when you get into taking payments and things like that, 
it's super easy to throw a credit card form on a page. And so with all the, the hacking and the security problems and all the stuff that's been coming out the last few years, you got to keep in mind that a lot of people are going to be paranoid. They're going to be like, eh, this doesn't look terribly uh, legit. Like this, something seems not right here. And so you want to consider that. And one of the things that you can do is add little bits of copy around elements that are kind of signaling go to the next step or go do the next thing. So an example of this would be if you have a, a sign-up form for your application and you've taken somebody's credit card number, maybe their email and password and all that stuff, and they're, they're going to start a trial of your application, it would be very good to have some microcopy near the button that they're going to click. So if it says something like sign up and get started near that button. So usually I'll put this as like a, a slightly smaller font size beneath the, the button that they're going to click. I'll, I'll tell them what's going to happen. It's like, okay, when you click this button, we're going to start your trial. This trial is going to run until this date. And then we're going to charge you this amount of money. And we're going to do that every month until you cancel your subscription. So that may seem unnecessary and, and unnecessarily wordy and all these things. But for the users that are kind of on the fence where they're like, ah, uh, I don't know about this. I don't, what's going to happen? Like, am I, how long does my trial last? What's, what's, what's actually going to happen? By adding microcopy, what you're effectively doing is you're clarifying, okay, here's exactly what's going to happen. There's no surprises. We're not trying to mislead you. And that's going to give a level of comfort to that user that they would get in the real world if you were to answer their question of like, oh, okay, so what happens after I sign up? Same exact thing. Again, conversational interfaces. So this is a form of conversation. It's a short conversation, but it's an important conversation. So when you click sign up and get started, you're, this is what's going to happen. It's not a surprise. It's not going to, you know, make the person be unnecessarily fearful of what's going to happen after the button is clicked. And again, this may sound silly, this may sound unnecessary, but these little details are going to help those users who would have that kind of apprehension about uh, performing some action or step in your application if the UI doesn't totally communicate that like, okay, this is, this is legit. Um, so that's, that's, that's number two. Number three is button labels and what I like to just call next steps. So typically I, I think about these in like the, it's like the wizard UI. So if, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? It's onboarding. So when you, when you first sign up for an application and they kind of walk you through like, here's what the application is, here's how it works, here's what it does, here's how to find this, blah, 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 blah. When someone's moving through that process, typically you're going to have a way to move between the steps. So you'll have like a back button and you'll have a forward button or a, a next button. And so it's super easy to keep those buttons and those labels generic. So you can just say, um, you know, previous to next, right? That's not going to hurt anything, but what it's, it's basically leaving an opportunity on the table. And that opportunity, just like we, we just talked about with the, the text that's kind of demystifying what happens next when you click the sign up button, in flows like this where you have a bunch of tasks that you need to complete as the user, it's demystifying what's coming next. It's going to set an expectation for you. And so it kind of primes the user's mind to think like, oh, okay, this is, this is what's going to happen now. And again, this may seem totally unnecessary, but the point is that you're making the user comfortable. There's no surprises. There's no hidden anything. And it's setting expectations as you go so that as the user uses the interface, they're feeling more invited. It's like uh, if, you've, if you've ever uh, gone to a, a high-end retail store. So uh, my favorite one um, is, uh, what, what are they called? Coach. So Coach purses. Whenever you, you walk into their store, there's generally within like maybe 10 to 15 seconds, uh, one of their sales associates is going to walk over to you and kind of introduce you or welcome you to what's going on. And they're also going to kind of guide you in terms of what you should do next. And they're doing that because it's influencing the sale or the potential sale. So they'll say things like, hey, welcome to coach. Do you have any, uh, any questions or could I help you? 
Uh, and typically people are like, no, I'm just looking around. And they'll say, great, if you need me, I'm going to be over here. Uh, once you've picked something out, come and find me. And so that little bit of hint or microcopy in their speech of come and find me once you've picked something out, they're basically planting the idea in your mind that you're going to pick something out. And so when it kind of shifting back to uh, a user interface, you can kind of hint people in a certain direction by using microcopy on buttons in terms of where you're guiding somebody. So um, one example might be maybe you're, you're onboarding a user for a web app that happens to have an iOS or a mobile app. And so as they're moving through the process, maybe they say, okay, fill out your, your name and information here. And then the next step is you're going to download the app for iOS or Android or something like that. So instead of just on the next button saying next, say next colon download for iOS. It's kind of hinting to the user and getting them primed. And this serves a ton of different purposes. Again, it's it's demystifying things, but it's also getting them potentially excited because if there's somebody who really likes to use their, their mobile device over a, a web app or a browser, they're going to get excited when they say, oh, cool, there's, there's something for iOS here. And you're just using microcopy to kind of tell them these things without directly telling them, if that makes any sense. You're, you're hinting at like, hey, this is possible or hey, this is coming up. So again, when it comes to to buttons and text that's going to be around buttons in like a wizard flow or an onboarding flow, always consider telling the user what's coming next. Always kind of hint at like, hey, here's what's just around the corner. Super important. Uh, one more that I like is tool tips. So these are super helpful for explaining why something exists or how something works. So uh, a good example of this might be on a form for maybe like I'm, I'm booking a hotel room and out of nowhere there's a field for my social security number and out of context that seems a little strange it's kind of like why why would a hotel booking app need my social security number and so there's an opportunity here we could do nothing we could just say give us your social security number Um, but we have to consider we're creating a hesitation there a point of hesitation so we're saying like hey give us this super uh, secure or sensitive information and not explaining to the user, that's a terrible experience. And that leaves a lot of room for people to just say, "Mm, I'm walking away from this. I I don't want to deal with this. Uh, So something that you can do is add a tooltip. So a tooltip is like a little popover bubble. So these are like little pop-up bubbles that appear near an input. And usually the way that you trigger them or reveal them is there's like a little, it's like a it's a circle with a question mark inside of it. And it's basically you hover over that and then the, the tool tip pops up for you. And so in that tool tip, what you can do is utilize microcopy to say, hey, here's why we need this thing. You know, like, don't, don't worry. We're not going to use this for any purposes. We're not going to store this. We're just going to use this to verify your identity. Fine. What you've just done is you've removed that barrier. You've, you've told the user, here's why we need this information or here's the significance of this information. And so little things like that are, they're not just demystifying, but you, you also want to consider how they're teaching the user. They're teaching them, hey, here's how this thing works, or here's how you should think about using this thing. And again, you're building that rapport with the user through a conversation in your user interface without actually being physically present. You're not talking to them necessarily. You're talking to them indirectly. You're saying like, hey, here's what's going on here. Here's how this works. Here's why you need to do this. And it's just making it that much friendlier for the user to interact with. And it's making it a lot easier for them to trust what you're, what you're uh, trying to get them to do or where you're trying to lead them. Uh, so the, the last one that I want to talk about here, and this one is, I'm hesitant to call it microcopy, but it, it, to me, it, it feels like one of those things that is easy to overlook. And I'm going to pick on somebody here. Hopefully this doesn't get me in trouble. Uh, but there's one that, that really gets me, and I come across it often, uh, and that's the database service Compose. And I, I come across it often because typically when I'm working with mentees at Clever Beagle uh, and we're starting to put their, their apps into production, we'll use uh, the Compose database service because it's really easy to spin up databases. But <laughs> there's, there's one little part of their interface that I always have to explain, and it's one of those things that 
I'm kind of like, why, why was that the choice? And I haven't bothered to, to reach out and ask him. I've just kind of, you know, belabored, like explaining to people like, Hey, okay, this is what this is. This is what this means. But I, I, this, just thinking about this example makes me want to consider it as something to think about in your microcopy. And that is navigation labels. So literally the, the menu items or navigation items that you've got like the top of the page or in a hamburger menu that flies out or literally anywhere on the page, anywhere you have like a list of menu items. And the thing I want to pick on Compose about is what they're helping you to do is set up databases. So you're creating databases to store data for your application. Relatively straightforward concept. Um, and so when you, when you sign up for Compose, they have this concept of a deployment. And a deployment is a group of databases. So basically they're saying like, here's a deployment for uh, your app. So like right now I'm working on my SAS command and I have a deployment on Compose called command, which groups together all of the different databases that I have. So I have one for uh, production and I have one for staging. And every so often I'll spin up a third one for my development environment if I want to see how things are going to behave with a remote database. So I've got my, my command deployment and I've got all of my databases for my different environments. And when you go to the Compose interface, they, they have a, a navigation. So you, you click on your, your deployment and then you get a sub navigation for your deployment. And the first few times you use it, you're like, where, where the hell are my databases? How do I create a database? What, where are the databases? And what you find out is that the navigation item to get to your databases is labeled browser not databases. So you would think like, oh, I should be able to click on a menu item called databases to get to my list of databases. But in this case, for whatever reason, they've chosen the word browser. And again, this is, this is microcopy in a sense that's trying to help the user find their way. And here we see a, a lost opportunity where a really straightforward navigation label that literally just says, this thing is what it is. So instead of browser, I would expect to see databases as a user. If you call it databases, there's zero confusion. I'm very, it's very easy for me to quickly find what I'm looking for without having to think through it. And technically in this interface, the only reason that you even know that it's related to databases, that word browser, is because they have an icon that's traditionally used with databases. That's it. So otherwise, you're pretty much lost to just kind of click around and figure out like, uh okay, where is this thing? And that's why I brought up navigation uh, as a bit of microcopy that you want to pay attention to because if your users are constantly feeling lost or they're confused by the way that you're labeling things, you need to give that some attention. You want to think about like, okay, how is my labeling either making this obvious for users or confusing the hell out of them? And I, I, I this is this is totally just a an anecdotal thing or just like an observational thing. I, I can't say that this is definitively why this happens, but I feel like a lot of people want to be original or unique in every little detail of their application. And realistically, that's a, a terrible choice. And the reason why is that people have mental models, especially now. So maybe back in like the early 2000s, mid 2000s, when you know, like people are just starting to integrate this sort of stuff into their daily lives, this would have been the case. But nowadays, there's an established, uh, I guess, a dictionary or understanding, like a mental model of what a web application is and how it works. And so it's super important that you avoid that tendency toward, oh, well, I want to make this super unique, or I want this to be um, original, and I want to be original and stand out. Your users don't care about that. They care about being able to get what they want as quickly as possible. They want to extract value from your product as quickly as possible. And when you create these hurdles in the form of, granted, original copywriting, like it's, it's something like, okay, browser's pretty, like, okay, I'd, I'd like to talk to the person who came up with that. That took some thinking. But that thinking led to confusion in the interface. And it slowed me down as a user and slowed down the people that I'm teaching. And I would guess countless other customers and users that Compose has. Is, has is, Compose has. Um, and so it just adds this unnecessary friction to the equation that doesn't need to be there. So really consider when you're, la you're labeling your navigation, like make it obvious. Just call it what it is. You don't need to be creative at 
things that are basically going to lead users around your app. Because when you do that, you're really risking somebody getting lost and being kind of disenchanted with your product and just going away. They're going to say, this is too confusing. I'm out of here. I'm going to go use a competitor. So something to consider. Uh, so I, I think we're going we're gonna to wrap it up here. I've, I've kind of covered all the bases and, and given you some examples of uh, what I think is important about microcopy and how you should think about microcopy. And, and to kind of summarize what we're getting at here, the point is when you're writing microcopy in your user interface, you just want to be human. You don't want to have this kind of robotic approach to things because when we think about using a computer, it's really easy to just kind of default to boring kind of like computer ease. I've heard that word used before. It's like, uh, like this is required. Technically, it checks the box. Technically, it does the job. But which is more fun? This is required or, hey, you forgot your first name. Notice the difference and notice how that is going to impact the way that people experience your application and the way that they feel about it. Because ultimately, that emotional response that they have to it is going to dictate whether or not they come back and whether or not they share it with other folks. So if they feel good about it, they're going to want to say, hey, you should check this out. This thing is really fun. I think you're really going to like this. So that's it. You want to consider how is my interface having a conversation with people and in what way is it being helpful and in what way is it making the user feel comfortable about using this product? Because as soon as you nail that, things like aesthetics can kind of fall to the wayside. I don't want to say you want to ignore aesthetics and the style and like the visual design of your application, but adding things like these and making the application just useful at its core is going to mitigate the need for a really fancy polished UI because ultimately people just want their problems solved. They don't really care about fancy animations and pretty stuff. Yes, that does add to the experience, but that isn't the point. The point is make the thing do the thing that they expect it to do because that's what you technically promised in your marketing and everything else. So I think that's going to do it for this week. Uh, thanks again for listening, folks. Uh, if you'd want, um, this same topic has been covered over on the Clever Beagle blog. So if you go over to cleverbeagle.com slash blog, uh, you can read a written copy of this and I've kind of itemized all the stuff we talked about today. So go ahead and check that out um, and have some fun writing microcopy. <laughs>